And I recognize that uh, the room is full and there's even more outside. And so thank you guys too. I recognize you're out there and appreciate you coming this morning. Please stand up. Oh, happy to. Um, we just finished week five of the Capitol. And so we're about a third of the way through this session. And um, as you know, there's a lot of, of, of big items coming before us, some controversial issues. Uh, I want you to know in the five weeks, we've only passed three bills. And so we're trying to take our time and do things the right way. And we are trying to be thoughtful and diligent about what we're doing. And to that point, there's only been three bills filed or passed this entire session. But first of all, I want to, to recognize and acknowledge that there are controversial issues on the docket right now. We understand that, and there's a lot of emotion involved. Uh, they divide I ones. I understand that to a point. Um, I want to say thank you to the people of District 6, uh, 19 because as we went through this process, with the exception of just a very few, very rare emails and a couple phone calls, the people in this district have been very civil uh, in their communications with us, and I appreciate that because we accomplish a lot more if we have a civil dialogue. And um, the people of this district, I want to thank you because that has happened to this point, and, and we appreciate that. We've been contacted by many, many people on both sides of these issues. There's a lot of issues going through. We're getting emails and calls on both sides of it. And we are doing our best to get back with you. Um, some of you I've talked to. Some of you came in my office in, this, in the Senate. Um, we've tried to respond to emails. And so we're doing our best. And I want you to know that. Um, but there's a lot of issues going through. And so uh, please be patient on that. We're going to get to those emails and calls. Um, uh, first of all, there, uh, some of the, you know, I know there's a lot of educators in the room. And so I want to talk first about school supplemental aid. Um, that is something that uh, is important to all of us. It's an issue that brought on, out comments on both sides. People that think we're not giving enough money to schools, people that think we're giving too much money to schools. We're trying to, we're trying to strike a balance. <laughs> we're trying to strike a balance. But here's a little background. I wrote my newsletter last week about educating, uh, education funding. And it talked generally about the priority that it is in our Iowa budget. We spend about 43 to 45% of our state budget on K through 12 education. When you add in preschool, when you add in community colleges, we add in the region schools, we're spending about 55% of our budget on education. It's obviously a priority, and we know that, and it always has been. Um, when it came down to funding for this year, um, the first thing I want to talk about is, is the process and what has happened with that. When we came into session, we were facing about $120 million shortfall in our budget. And we had to make decisions about where we're going to cut at the state level in order to balance that budget. We made a decision with the House and the Governor that we were not going to touch K-12 through education. We did not cut a dollar from K-12 through education as we were cutting $120 million from our state budget. And that's difficult because it is such a large part of our budget. But we did not want to see layoffs. We did not want to see um, property taxes raised in the middle of the school year. So we made that decision. And um, I'm proud of that. Whether um, uh, you know, whether it was the right decision or not, there was arguments that we should, we should look at everything across the board cuts like happened under Governor Culver. I'm proud that we kept K-12 harmless. As we went um, into the session, we allocated an additional $40 million to K-12 education. And um, <clears throat> I know that there's a lot of information out there saying we cut schools. We did not cut education funding. We added an additional $40 million to that. And so um, how we came up with that number, frankly, it was a number that we thought was sustainable for the long-term budget. We did not want to promise an amount that, this has happened many times before I got to the legislature. The legislature would promise a certain amount to the schools, it comes time to write the check, and they didn't fund it. And so the school board members and the superintendent are left with bad decisions. We wanted an amount that we felt was sustainable for the long-term. And so that's why we came up with the $40 million. In addition, we have committed to work on balancing out some of the inequities in education across the state. And some of it's in transportation and cost per pupil and a lot of different things. I've asked our administration to provide some examples of how that affects Ankeny. And so we've committed to work on putting more money into that. The last thing that is important to me um, as we work on education funding and how we operate our schools is for too long the legislature has set up programs and said you have to spend this much money on this program this much on this program, this much on this program. And so we give all the money to the schools, but they all have strings attached. And we know that Ankeny is not the same as Des Moines. It's not the same as Johnston or Pella or Grinnell or Montezuma. They're all different. And we need to recognize that and give our school board and superintendent the ability to make a budget that's best for Ankeny. 
And so I've committed, I'm working with Kevin on it, and John is working on this as well. We are doing whatever we can to try to cut some of those strings. I'll give you an example of, of a real world, it's kind of a silly example, but it's a real example. There is a category of funding to repair buses. There's a different category to buy new buses. So if a school needs to repair an engine on a bus for two or $3,000, they have no money in their repair account. So they were going and buying a new bus when they could have spent a couple thousand dollars on fixing the bus. A couple years ago, we cut that string and said, fix your bus, buy a new bus, whatever you gotta do, we shouldn't control it to that level. And so we cut that string. But there are examples over and over and over again in our state budget, or in our education funding, like that. And so we're gonna try to fix that and I'm proud to work on that. Um, the next thing, obviously, we're here to talk about is collective bargaining reform. I know that is the, the interest of most people in this room, most people out in the hallway. That's what we're here to talk about. And so I um, wanted to address that right away. When I decided to run for office, I made a commitment that I was going to work on big issues. I was going to work on reforms that I think will have a lasting positive impact on the state of Iowa. And so as we look at some of those reforms, um, we're looking at collective bargaining. As you know, collective bargaining was set up, um, it's also called Chapter 20, as you hear that in the, in the media, because it's Chapter 20 in the Iowa Code. But that was set up in 1975 and it's been used ever since. 77? 77? In the 70s. Okay, so it was implemented in the mid-70s. And it's been used ever since. Um, there's been proposed changes, there's been slight changes, but that system's been in place for, for over 40 years. Um, I know that there's a lot of teachers in this room. There's a lot of state employees, city employees, county employees. I appreciate your work. This is not about not appreciating the work of the state of my, my mother worked in a school for 20 years. I have good friends at work. Okay, folks, this is not going to be a good, good way to share information. We've done 20 years without having to be disrespectful to you and have you be disrespectful to our people. I don't want to have to be the person that has to say this. It's kind of a pain, but please, let people talk, and we're going to do the same thing for you. That's all we ask. Yeah, respect is good. <laughs> so... Um, that being said, these changes and uh, reforms in collective bargaining are something I believe in. I believe it's something that we have to do for our state, and I'll be honest with you, I believe in that. Um, I believe in what we're doing, but that being said, I've spent the last week talking with constituents, had a, a Des Moines police officer that lives in Aiken in my office last week, going through some of the concerns. I've talked on the phone, emails, <clears throat> we're hearing some of the concerns, and we're taking those back, and we're going to look at them, and we're going to see what we can change in that bill. Um, not going to make any promises on that because we have to find agreement with everyone. But I want you to know um, there's already a couple things that we're looking at changing, and that's how this process works. And so there's a public hearing Monday night at the, in the House, and then from there we'll see if the bill's ready and move forward. But um, Senate filed 123 is really, to me, it's about empowering our local governments and our local school board and our superintendent. And if we want to have efficient, effective schools that can be innovative, that can provide the best service for our people, I believe we need to make some of these reforms. And I think that Senate File 120, or 213 rebalances the, the scale between the employer, the employee, and the taxpayer. And we need balance there if this system is going to work long term. And I think that this bill does that. And so um, I know one of the big, you know, there's a lot of misinformation going around as well. And so I want to address some of that right away. Um, and, you know, I understand there's going to be more concerns than this, but some of the things I'm hearing over and over, um, some, of the, some of the things that I'm hearing, I just want to address those right away. Um, first of all, this bill does not take away your health care. In fact, the bill mandates that you have health care. It's going to leave some of the decisions on what that looks like up to your local schools. It does not take away your health care. This does not take... This bill does not take all the health care plans of every school and city and county and put it into one giant state pool. The governor has made, uh, talked about that as a possible idea. That's not in this bill. It's not included at all. It's not going to happen. And my preference is when we do that, we are able to allow the school to decide if they want to come in or not. And if they like what, what's going on with their health insurance program, don't join. We want to try to make that better. That's a proposal for down the road. It's not even in this bill. This bill does not affect private sector unions. It's public sector workers at all, or period. It does not affect the, the private sector unions. It does not repeal the right to collective bargain. It does not repeal the right to collective bargain. It does not affect your pension. There's nothing in this bill that is changing your pension. 
Okay, and it does not require the local governments. Oh, I said that it does not require the local governments to join the healthcare plan. So um, I understand we're going to get a lot of feedback. I appreciate that. We're going to take that down to the capital. And um, uh, there's a lot of other issues I'm sure we'll get to, but I wanted to address those right away in the opening comments. So I appreciate you being here.